Hello, welcome to another of the AICHE Connected Annual Meeting and Interviews. I'm John O'Connell, uh, Professor Emeritus, University of Virginia, and AICHE board member. And uh, I have the privilege today of talking with Professor John Prosnitz, who is Professor of the Graduate School at the University of California, Berkeley, and also Faculty Senior Sciences at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. The occasion for this interview is that the prestigious AICHE Institute Lecture has been renamed the John M. Prosnitz AICHE Institute Lecture. Each year since 1949, the Executive Board of the Com Program Committee has invited a distinguished member of the AICHE to present a comprehensive, authoritative review of the chemical engineering practice in his or her field of specialization. Uh, the renaming is to honor Professor Prowsnitz as one of chemical engineering's most extraordinary leaders, and an endowment has been established to ensure the lecture's future uh, and to enhance its prestige. Professor Prowsnitz's honors and accomplishments are too numerous to mention here. Just look him up on the web and you'll, you'll be overwhelmed. Uh, rather, we hope to give you some insights into his scholarly and human values, as well as why so many colleagues former students and industrial workers have responded so generously and positively to the contributing to the endowment. So, John, welcome uh, to this conversation and congratulations on having made so many great impacts on our profession that the Institute Lecture now bears your name. Well, thank you, John. It's a great honor for me, certainly, to get this award. I've gotten many awards in my lifetime, but I think this is the one that's most meaningful to me because it's given by my friends, people who actually know me, and the other awards were not in that category. So I'm very happy to be here to talk with you. Uh, I should perhaps mention for the record that uh, John O'Connell is a former graduate student of mine from way back. And ever since he came to Berkeley as a graduate student and ever after, we've been close friends. We've kept in close contact, and his friendship is very, very much meaningful to me. Well, perhaps we can start by asking what motivated you to study chemical engineering, and especially to create the field of molecular thermodynamics that transformed our pedagogy and applications of product, process and product design. I was fortunate uh, in having good advice. Uh, my fourth grade teacher was a friend of my mother's, and her brother-in-law was a very successful chemical engineer, and she mentioned this to my mother. I was quite uh, young at the time, of course, but that uh, started the idea in my mind. And then I was again very fortunate in high school. I had excellent teachers in chemistry, in physics, and in mathematics. And I did very well in all of those subjects. So that uh, it was quite obvious to me I wanted to do something in the sciences. And of course, I also wanted to do something that has applications. So chemical engineering was, uh, I'm sure, the right choice for me. I went to Cornell University right after World War II. And uh, right from the start, uh, I was in the chemical engineering department. And uh, I was there at Cornell for five years. At that time, the Bachelor of Chemical Engineering degree took five years. And uh, I had a very productive time at Cornell. I really learned a lot there. It was tough. It was very tough in the sense that most of my classmates were returning veterans from the war. I was a young 17-year-old, I had a very sheltered life, and here were these uh, retired veterans who obviously knew much more about real life than I did. And uh, it was very difficult for me to keep up with them. But uh, I learned it and uh, adjusted. There are two things that happened at Cornell for which I'm particularly grateful. One is there was a very uh, intense course in unit operations laboratory, and one of the main requirements of that laboratory was writing. We had to write reports, uh, oh, I think every two weeks, and the course lasted two semesters. 
So I really had to learn to write, and the professor in charge were very good about correcting uh, or making me correct uh, my own writing. I was, they would say, this is not satisfactory, now do it again. They would give me some suggestions on how to do it. So I'm really uh, very grateful of that. To, to emphasize the importance of writing, the grading in that course was rather unusual. Uh, on a given report, you got two grades, each one from zero to ten. Uh, one grade was for the technical content, and the other grade was for the English exposition. And uh, the overall grade recorded in the book was the product of the two. Uh, and the argument is very simple, if 70% of your technical work is okay, but only 70% was done in good English, then only 49% of the report is satisfactory. So this was pretty rough, but uh, it emphasized to me the importance of writing. It's something that I've really learned and tried to pass on to all my co-workers. John may remember that, uh, that uh, I'm pretty tough when it comes to writing. And although the students at the time may not enjoy it, later on they're very grateful for having learned that. Because no matter what you do later on in life, you're always going to have to write. So that was one thing that I got out of Cornell. The other one that I also very much enjoyed, it was required at that time, unfortunately it's not true anymore, that uh, students in chemical engineering take one year course, a one year course on the history of science. And that really opened uh, new horizons. I learned about things I'd never heard of before, how science interacts uh, with culture how science really got started and how it developed over the centuries. It was a very good uh, teacher, uh, Professor Gerlach, who uh, was a specialist on, on French science, about uh, the late 18th century French science, in particular the history of chemistry. So I enjoyed the course very much and I've enjoyed it ever since. I, ever since that time I uh, do reading in history of science and the philosophy of science and so on, economics, uh, it's broadened my horizons tremendously, so I'm very grateful to Cornell uh, for that. Is that enough, or should I keep going? <laughs> well, uh, tell us about uh, getting into Mulligan's own names. Yes, uh, that happened in Princeton. Uh, I, of course, took a course in thermodynamics at uh, Cornell, but uh, I enjoyed it, but it was not particularly important to me, and there was nothing molecular about it. I enjoyed physical chemistry, and that of course is molecular, so that perhaps had an influence. But the most important influence was the following. I went to Princeton and one of the requirements for my PhD, and one of the Princeton requirements for a PhD was that you had to give uh, ten propositions. Propositions were proposals for research. You didn't have to do the research, but you're supposed to suggest a good research topic. And so in order to do, and, and furthermore, most of those, I think eight out of the ten, had to be in the subject area other than your thesis. So it was a way to get you to broaden out. And so naturally what I did is what everybody did. I went to the library. I started looking around to see what might be suitable. And in the library I discovered a book uh, called uh, uh, Solubility of Non-Electrolytes by Joel Hildebrand and his co-worker, Robert Scott. Hildebrand uh, was a professor at uh, Berkeley, and he wrote this book about solubility, which is sort of a book on molecular thermodynamics, if you will. And that had a tremendous influence on me. I also found another book by Guggenheim, an English thermodynamicist, and the book had a very nice title. The book was called Mixtures. So uh, I studied those two books and I was fascinated and I decided this is what I would uh, really like to do. My thesis at Princeton had nothing to do with molecular thermodynamics. It was, a, it was an area of reactor design and we studied concentration fluctuations in a packed bed reactor. And I have no regrets, I learned a lot from that experience. But uh, by the time I got out of Princeton, it was clear to me that I wanted to do uh, 
thermodynamics from the molecular point of view. And uh, after Princeton, I went to uh, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And there were many reasons for that. Berkeley is a wonderful place. But one reason is that Joel Hildebrand was there. Now, he was already quite old. Uh, he was uh, already retired, at least officially retired. In fact, he was still quite active. But that was one of the attractive features uh, of Berkeley. And I got to know Joel Hildebrand very well. We worked together for years, wrote a book together. And uh, I learned an awful lot from him. So he encouraged me in the area of molecular thermodynamics, as did some of the other people in chemistry. There are two other people, one was named Pitzer, Kenneth Pitzer, who was uh, one of great influence in my life, and another one's called Leo Brewer. They were both professors of chemistry, and they uh, influenced me very much to think molecularly. Well, having been a student, about this, uh, you know, we we got all definitely into it from all all levels. Um, I was going to point out that the September 2015 issue of the AICAG Journal was devoted to you as a founders issue, and it was reported that you had 610 co-authors in 800 published papers. How did you do that? Well, I, I did a lot of hard work. Is talk about it. <laughs> Uh, because I enjoyed it, not because I uh, was forced to do it. Uh, but I think what played a big role is the atmosphere at Berkeley. Uh, chemical engineering at Berkeley is not in the College of Engineering. It's in the College of Chemistry, which is unusual. And so I was surrounded by chemistry people. And uh, they were all very, very productive. The chemistry department at Berkeley was and still is considered one of the finest chemistry departments in the world. And so interacting with these uh, very good scholars and very productive scholars uh, naturally has an effect. You want to keep up somehow with what they're doing. Uh, not that you're forced to, but you sort of feel I'm in this environment where everybody's working hard, doing things, so I want to do that too. I don't want to be an outsider. I don't want to be left out. So the atmosphere of high productivity at, at Berkeley at that time, is still true today, but I think it was even more so at that time, uh, that had a tremendous influence. Another factor, which is by no means negligible, uh, I have a very understanding wife. Uh, lots of wives resent it when their husbands uh, are uh, away in their office or in their study at home. Uh, I fortunately didn't have that problem. My wife, Susie is her name, was always uh, very supportive and uh, took care of all the various domestic things that needed to be taken care of. So that was uh, also a, a, a big help. Well, let me ask one more question, and that is, uh, what do you say to students and young professionals about managing their careers, adapting to the future, and contributing to their profession and society? What, they, what are they contributing? No. I'm what sorry. do you say to them? Or what do I say to them? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, I, I say several things. One of the things I say is, uh, be broad. Don't specialize. At least, of course, you have to specialize to some extent. Uh, don't over-specialize. Uh, there is this tendency amongst our younger people to get narrower and narrower, and that is a very bad trend. I certainly think that is a bad trend for a variety of reasons. One is you are ultimately much more productive uh, if you allow stimuli from other areas. That's how you get new ideas. If you're just always in the same area and only talking to people who are also in that area, then no new ideas come in. It becomes uh, sort of a unproductive after a while. A very good analogy was pointed out years ago that knowledge is like a balloon. The balloon expands because it's in contact with the outside. There's nothing really happening inside the balloon. It's what's happening outside the balloon that makes it expand. Uh, I think that's absolutely true, and I try to convey that idea to my co-workers and students. Um, 
don't just spend all your time doing chemical engineering. Learn something else. Learn something about economics or about law or philosophy or literature and whatnot. So there is a, a reason to do that, and the reason is that it makes you a much more productive individual. But there's another reason, and the other reason is it makes you a happier person. It's uh, a source of happiness to know what's going on in the world or what has been going on in the world of knowledge. You're a much more interesting person. You become much more of a conversationalist. You can uh, interact with people from all over uh, society. So I urge the students, uh, don't uh, choose your roommates or your apartment mates from other chemical engineers. Uh, try to get friends uh, from other areas, people from law or literature or economics or what have you. Uh, I know this is often hard to do, but uh, to the extent that it can be done, you should really try to do it. So I, uh, I emphasize this a lot. Well, unfortunately, I've got tons of other questions I'd love to ask, but time is very on us. So. I want to thank Professor Brosnitz for giving us a stimulating time and uh, encourage everyone to attend the inaugural J.M. Brosnitz Institute lecture this week. It's going to be uh, tomorrow on Wednesday. It's going to be given by Professor Doros Theodoro of the National Technical University of Athens. Thank you, John. Thank you. Enjoyed talking with you.